The word of life that God has permitted for us today comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 10 through 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 10 through 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verses 10 through 15 says, So they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. They sacrificed to the Lord that day 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep from the spoil they had brought. They entered into the covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death whether small or great, man or woman. Moreover, they made an oath to the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, with trumpets, and with horns. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart and had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. And this is the word of God. Amen. So good afternoon, everyone. Yes, it's good to see all of you in God's house today. So based upon 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 10 through 15, I want to share with you this message entitled, King Asa's Covenant to Seek the Lord God. So this message is about King Asa and his life. Asa was the third king in the southern kingdom of Judah. So just to refresh our memories, remember that Israel had three kings during the unified kingdom, right? The three kings during the unified kingdom were Saul and David and Solomon, right? Now Solomon, even though he was a good king, towards the latter part of his life, the Bible says that he had a lot of wives and concubines, right? So a thousand altogether. And they were not all from Israel. They were foreign wives. So for example, he would marry princesses from other countries to form political alliances, right? And when they did that, what would they do? These princesses will bring their own idols, right? Their gods to Solomon's, you know, uh, palace. And Solomon would start to follow their gods and commit idolatry. And this was a sin before God. Right? So that became the main reason why after Solomon died, the kingdom was divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Right? So after Solomon died, the kingdom got divided, ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south, Judah and Benjamin in the south. Right? And the first king in the divided kingdom was Rehoboam. Okay? That was Solomon's son, Rehoboam. He became the first king in, in the divided kingdom. The second king was Abijah. And then the third king was Asa, who is the topic of today's message. Okay. So when the kingdom was divided, it was in the year 930 BC. All right. Now when Asa became king, that was in the year 910 BC. And he reigned for 40 years until 869 B.C. All right. So what was special about this guy named Asa? The meaning of his name is healer. The name Asa means what? Healer or healing. It's a good name, right? We all need healing. Asa's name means healing. And he was the first good king in the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay? If you read the, the record about the kings, they all have, at the end of their story, they all have this evaluation, either at the end or the beginning. God says whether he was a good king or he was a wicked king. 
And Asa was the first good king in the southern kingdom of Judah. So let's look at his life. What made him good? And then what happened at the end of his life? Okay. There were three major events that happened to Asa during his life. And through his life, we're going to learn about our own life, right? Because I believe all of us here are basically good Christians, right? So Asa was a good king. But what happened to him at the end? That's going to be very important for us. So at first, he was a good king, so he sought the Lord. The Bible says Asa sought the Lord, and so there was peace for the first 10 years of his life, uh, of his uh, reign. Asa sought the Lord. So for the first 10 years of his reign, there was peace. God gave him peace. Everything was good. All right. That's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. The key to Asa being a good king and the key to his success was that he sought God. Okay? He, he, he was seeking God. Okay? In Hebrew, the word is darash, darash. Okay, Dorash, and it means, literally it means a passionate, oops, a passionate pursuit of something. So what, what does Dorash mean? A passionate pursuit of something. Isn't that like a car commercial? A passionate pursuit of whatever, Lexus, I don't know. So Darash means a passionate pursuit of something or someone. It can also mean to study or to investigate. Okay? So Asa at first passionately pursued God. Okay? And that's why he prospered and God gave him rest all around. So for example... In 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 7, this is what he says. For he said to Judah, let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. See here he repeats the word sought, darash. We darashed him and because we darashed him we still have this land and that's why he has given us rest on every side. So this is the key to Asa's being good in his life of faith. So this is what we need to do in our life. We need to passionately pursue God, right? But what are we passionately pursuing right now? Right? We all have something that we're passionate about. Is it video games? You know, or boys and girls? Uh, what are we passionately pursuing right now? It has to be God, right? But have you ever passionately pursued God in your life at all? That's something that we need to be thinking about. If we call ourselves Christians, then we need to passionately pursue God. For example, Ezra was a prophet who was determined to study God's law, right? That word study there in Hebrew is the same word, darash. He passionately delved into God's word to study it, to find God in the Bible, in the scriptures. Okay? So the record about Asa's life uh, covers three chapters. They all appear in first, the Second Chronicles, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. Okay? So a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of volume in the Bible about him, right? Three full chapters. And if you read these three chapters, the word darash appears a total of seven times. Okay. Remember, seven is a very important number in the Bible, right? It means perfection and completion. So seven times this word appears in his, in his um, record about Asa. So in first, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 14, 14, verses 1 through 7, already has three of those instances of the word darash. Okay. So, that's what he did at the beginning, so for 10 years he had peace. And then the first major event of his life happens 
and that is a war. A war breaks out. War against Zera of Ethiopia. The Bible says, Zerah, who was the king of Ethiopia, uh, came and fought a war against King Asa. The problem is, Ethiopia back then was very powerful. How many people did he have in his army? The Bible says Zerah had a, a million man army. A one million man army. Whereas Asa had 300,000 soldiers. Now think about that, okay? Just to put that into perspective, today, right now, how many countries in the world has a million man army? Do you guys know? Hmm? Five. Five countries in the world have a million man standing army. Who do you think is number one? It's China, of course, two million. Number two, India. Yeah, India has a huge army. Number three, U.S. Number four is Russia. And guess who's number five? There you go, North Korea. (laughs) North Korea has a million-man army. So that's it. Only five countries in the world, even today, So imagine back then having a million-man army. That's huge, okay? And they came to attack southern kingdom of Judah. So this is recorded in 2 Chronicles 14, verses 8 through 9. So what did Asa do? During the battle, he was so outnumbered, right? Right? But what did Asa do? In 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 11, the Bible records the prayer that Asa prayed to God. He said, Lord, there is no one besides you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you and in your name have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God and let not man prevail against you. So this, is, this was the prayer that Asa prayed in his battle against Zerah with his million-man army. And this battle, if you actually read carefully, you will see that it took four years. It wasn't just like a one-time thing. The war lasted for four years. Okay? So, for example, Asa started reigning at 910 B.C., right? For the first 10 years, he had peace until 900 B.C., Zerah came to fight against Asa in 899 B.C., and it went on until the 15th year of his reign, which is at 895 B.C. Okay? So for four years, he had to fight this battle, and then finally, though, he won. Asa won. They won this battle against this million-man army. And obviously, what do you, how do you think they felt? I mean, this is great, Right? They were outnumbered 10 to 3. But because they prayed to God and they sought God, they were able to overcome them. So after they won this battle, this is where we pick up up in our text today. Okay, Remember it says, on the third day of the 15th year of his reign. That's right here in 895 BC. After this battle is over, after they won this war, they gathered together. He He made reforms, and then they entered into a covenant, the Bible says. Asa had all of Judah gathered together, and they made them enter into the covenant. And what was the content of this covenant? That's recorded in verse 12 of today's text, right? In 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 12, it says, They entered into the, gov- into the covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and soul. And whoever would not seek God will be put to death. That was the covenant that Asa and the entire country of Judah made with God. They said, we promise that we will seek God all the days of our life. 
And if anybody in this country doesn't, they will, what? What will happen to them? It says they will die, right? They made this pact. This is a contract, right? A covenant with God to see God all, with all their heart and soul. So this is what happened in the 15th year in 895 BC. And then immediately after that, the second incident of his life happens. Another war, right? War against Basha, king of Israel. Israel is the northern kingdom, right? So this is like a, basically a civil war. It's sort of like North Korea fighting against South Korea. Okay? Israel came, Basha, king of Israel, came and attacked Asa in the 16th year of Asa's reign. So in the 15th year, they finished their war against Ethiopia, and then they entered into covenant with God, right? And then immediately after that, in the 16th year, the northern kingdom of Israel came attacking. So why did this happen? Okay, there's a reason. In the 15th year, when people heard that they won against Ethiopia, and they heard that God was with Asa and with the southern kingdom of Judah, what started to happen was that people from the north started to defect into the south because they heard that God was with Asa. People who were living in the northern kingdom of Israel were all moving down south. And that, uh, Basha, the king of Israel, did not like that, right? So what did he do? He started to build walls. He started to build forts to prevent people from coming down. And then eventually, he attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. So that's what it says. In, if you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1, it says that Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. And the reason for that is if you go up a few verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 9, okay, 15, verse 9 says, he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who resided with them, for many defected to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord, his God, was with him. See, a lot of people defected to Asa. And that was the reason why the northern kingdom attacked Asa. Now, this was the problem right here. This is where the problem happens. How did Asa react to this? What was Asa's reaction? If you keep reading, it says, he took the dedicated gold and silver from God's house, okay? In God's temple, there are a lot of gold and silver vessels, right? That is dedicated for God's use, to be used during his worship. He took all that and gave it to who? He gave it to the king of Aram. The Arameans back then were very powerful, right? And he made a treaty with them. And he said, Please break your treaty with Israel and make a treaty with me and attack Israel so they will stop attacking us. And that's what happened. So the Aramean king went and attacked Israel so Israel could no longer attack Judah. So the war ended. Asa won. So from a human perspective, this was a brilliant diplomacy right here. Right? If you watch those political shows, this is what they do behind the scenes. They make treaties. They betray each other. That's how you win wars. Right? So Asa, from a human perspective, was a brilliant king. But the Bible says God was angry that he did this. If you, turn to, if you have your Bibles open, please turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 7 through 9. This is what it says. At that time, 
Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on, your, on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. And then he says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. He's reminding him. Remember what happened a few years back. A million-man army came to attack you, but because you sought God and you trusted in God, he helped you win against them, right? Israel is much smaller. But why did you not rely on God? Why did you rely on the Arameans? See, this was God. Through this prophet, he, God was, you know, rebuking him. And so in verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. So for the next 10 years, there was continuous battle between Israel and southern Judah. On and on, on and off, on and off. All going through the next 10 years. But just think about that. In the 15th year, he made a covenant, right? He said, we promise to seek God. And then the very next year when this thing happens, he didn't keep that promise. Only one year later. Do human beings forget that quickly? We do, right? We forget things that happened yesterday. So this is why God was angry at Asa. And not only that, he gave what was dedicated to God to this foreign king. The word dedicated there in Hebrew is kodesh, which means set apart for God's use only. He took all of those gold and silver that's holy to God and gave it to this foreign king. And so for the next 10 years, he has war against Israel until Basha dies. And then for about 13 or 14 years, there's nothing written about Asa's life. And then finally, the last major incident that happens in Asa's life is Asa Asa gets a foot disease. Okay? And the Bible says that it was very severe. Okay. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 12 through 13, it says, In the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord but the physicians. So Asa slept with his fathers, having died in the 41st year of his reign. So he was sick for two years, and he died from a foot disease, okay? So Bible's silent about what happened after the wars against Israel for about 13 or 14 years, and then all of a sudden the Bible says he got a foot disease. But then he still didn't seek God, so he died. What happened here? Asa was a good king, wasn't he? Right? Just like all, most of us here, I believe, are good Christians. Right? See, this foot disease was God giving Asa a final chance. Okay? It wasn't God punishing Asa, but it was God giving him his final chance. Because Asa made that covenant, right? That he would seek God. And God wanted to give him that chance again to prove himself. But he didn't do that. That was the problem. So the reason why Asa died of this foot disease was that he broke that covenant that he made with the people in his 15th year that they would seek God with all their heart and soul. Okay? So what does it mean to seek God in this situation? Does God not work through doctors and physicians? 
We're not this kind of people that says, oh, don't go to doctors, don't take medicine. I mean, we're not like that, right? Our church does not teach that. We go to doctors. We do take medicine. But what did Asa do wrong here? It's that he did not seek God first. That's the problem. There is this order. You have to seek God first through prayer. And then God works through common means like doctors and medicines, etc. But he did not seek God, but he sought physicians. So we have to pray first to God in everything that we do, even the little things. When this huge million-man army came, he sought God because that was a big problem. But when the minor problems happen, what do we do? We sort of forget about seeking God and we try to take care of it on our own, don't we? A lot of us, we do that. When the problem is big, we think, oh, that's big enough for God. But what the Bible teaches us is that every problem, no matter how small it is, you should take it to God first. Even the very insignificant things, even like a foot disease. And not only that, I think from Asa's life, what we could learn is this, that a lot of us at first love God and we serve God, we seek God. But as time goes, that love dissipates, right? So in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, when Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus, he says, you guys, I know that you guys have done everything good, but one thing I have against you is that you have left your first love. And he says, therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So like Asa, let's think about ourselves. Have we left that first love? At the beginning of his life, he really sought God, right? So remember, the record about Asa's life had used that word darash seven times, right? The last, the seventh time is where it's talking about his foot disease. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 12 through 13. In the first six instances of that word, it's all about him seeking God, and God let him find him, and God helped him to prosper and gave him rest all around. But in the final seventh time where that word is used, it says, even in this disease, he did not seek the Lord. First six times he sought God, but then in this final last time, he did not seek God, and so he died. Have, you guys know what the, this word entropy means? This is not science class, but have you heard of this word, entropy? It, it means like a, a gradual decline into disorder. So in science, what that means is everything in the universe, if you just leave it alone, what's going to happen? It's going to gradually decline into disorder and chaos and then whatever, right? Everything in the world gradually declines if you leave it alone, okay? So like your body, if you leave it alone, what happens? It just gradually declines, right? So what you see here used to be up here. That's entropy. No, that's not entropy. That's gravity. <laughs> so that's what happens, right? Everything in this world has entropy. Everything, if you just leave it alone, it's going to gradually decline into disorder. And that's true spiritually as well. So what I'm trying to say is this. Asa was good at first, but towards the end of his life, where was his faith? If you just leave it alone, it's just going to gradually go into disorder and chaos. So we have to take care of it. Like you have to, you know, I used to have muscles when I was in high school, but now they're gone. I don't know where they just disappeared, right? Because I didn't take care of it. It's the same thing spiritually. You have to take care of your faith and your soul 
constantly, every single day. Otherwise, it's going to go into spiritual entropy, and it'll just disappear. Just be, don't think, oh, you know, last year I was very good. I went to church every week. Don't think that that's going to save you this year or today. What you did yesterday doesn't matter. Okay? So, for example, when, when people go to church, this is what they say at church, right? You know, at church, your past doesn't matter. Have you guys heard that? At church, your past, whatever you did in the past, we don't ask. Doesn't matter, right? So even if you're like a criminal, whatever, it's okay. Now we accept you, right? But the opposite of that is true too, right? The other side of that. What's the other side of that? In church, the past doesn't matter. No matter how good you were in the past, that doesn't matter either. See, God is fair. Even your sins in the past doesn't matter. Even all the good work you did for God in the past doesn't matter. What you do right now matters. Your faith matters today, not in the past, okay? If you talk to Korean people who've been going to church a long time, everybody used to be like the president of youth group or whatever. Oh, yeah, I was the president of youth group and yelled those group. Now what are you doing? Well, I don't know. I don't go to church anymore. The past does not matter. It's all about your faith today. And Asa's past did not help him when the disease came. Okay? Your past, what you did for God in the past, will not help you today. Your parents' faith will not help you today. Okay? How do I believe in God right now? That's what matters. So if you look in Ezekiel chapter 18, Verses 26 through 32, this is what Ezekiel is talking about, okay? This is what he says. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies because of it, for his iniquity which he has committed, he will die, right? And then again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness which he has committed and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions which he committed. He will surely live. He will not die. But the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not right. They're saying, that's not fair, God. Because I did so much work for you in the past. Where's the credit? I don't get credit for that. And God says, no. God is very fair. He erases your past sins as well as your past good works. It's all about today, right now. So God says, repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. And he says at the end, repent and live. Okay? So what you did in the past, great. But what really matters is right now, today. Our faith today. Am I believing in God as I should be right now? Am I serving him? Am I loving him with that first love right now? That's all that matters. And that's what Asa's life is teaching us today. So I pray that all of us will re-examine ourselves to see if my faith today is what used to be or to see if my faith today is where God wants me to be. If not, then as Ezekiel says, let us repent and cast away our sins and return to God so that we may live. Amen? What Asa said at the beginning is what we need to do. We need to seek God with all our heart and soul every single day of our life for the duration of our life here on earth. What we did in the past, that's great, but that's not going to help us right now. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that you have given to us. Father God, through the life of King Asa, help us to re-examine ourselves and help us to see where we are today, right now. And may we be able to cast aside whatever stumbling blocks that may hinder us from coming closer to you, Lord. And I pray that you will enable us to repent and return to you fully and wholeheartedly And may we be able to seek you, Lord, with all of our heart and soul so that this moment will be the moment where I have the greatest faith right now. 
We thank you so much for everything that you have given to us. And because we are thankful, we have brought a small token as an offering to you, Lord. May you accept this offering with delight. May we be able to give our heart and our soul with this offering so that it is an offering that is pleasing in your sight and that it may be used for your glory and for your kingdom in this day and age. We thank you so much for everything that you have given to us. We give you all the glory and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.